Well, hello and welcome to another Mind Maxing podcast. This series is on adolescence to adulthood and the pathways and the journey that people take from adolescence to adulthood uh, and how education you know, in its current state and future state helps and or hinders that, that journey that, that people take. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with a, an old friend, colleague, uh, Mike Flanagan, uh, who I've known for, geez, it might be 35 years or 30 plus years. Um, we, we both uh, cut our teeth in the corporate learning, corporate training world, uh, working with Fortune 1000, Fortune 500, Fortune 50 companies, when they were really uh, exploring uh, learning technology uh, and how to leverage that learning technology to, to address their human capital needs. Uh, that was the term that was used at the time. Um, but I'm delighted to be here with Mike and, and uh, who, who heads up an organization, Mastery, which he'll talk about further. Um, and, and, and really, Mike, I'd like to, you to start with, you know, you know, a little bit about Mastery, but also um, how you see uh, education or educational structures and processes and so forth, uh, supporting people moving from adolescence to adulthood. So awesome. Well, thank, thanks for the invite, Lee. It's, it's really good to be here. And yeah, it's definitely been a long time since the e-learning days. Uh, yeah, so uh, Mastery Transcript Consortium, or MTC for short, is, uh, is the organization I lead. It's, uh, on the one hand, we're a small nonprofit. We're a membership association, and we consist of schools. Uh, you could think of us as a kind of a working coalition and online community of practice. Um, but what our schools have in common, we have over 400 high schools and middle schools, mostly here in the US, some overseas. Uh, what they all have in common is that they're really committed to innovation and rethinking what school is, what kids need to learn, uh, what they would call a portrait of a graduate. Uh, we often have this hypothetical of imagine the kids walking across the stage to get their diploma at the end of their high school journey. You know, what is it you want them to be able to actually do? Right? What skills do you want to give them when they go out into the world? Uh, and what our schools have in common is that they think to give those kids that essential mix of 21st century skills, which frankly needs to be very different now than it was when I was in high school, I think when you were in high school. Um, school has to be different too. Uh, we have to change how we teach, what we teach, and most importantly, how we assess kids. Uh, and what is interesting is that if you talk to enough school leaders who are doing that work, you will see that, first of all, innovation is there. There are literally tens of thousands of school leaders and teachers who are really interested in rethinking all these things because they're coming at it from different angles. Um, one of the single biggest kind of gating factors that they have, things keeping them from changing as quickly as they would like, are sort of the conventions and the systems of the college admissions process. And I mean no disrespect to our friends in higher ed admissions. They have a super tough job, right? If you're at uh, Northeastern University, you're getting 70,000 applications a year. If you're at UCLA, you're going to get over 100,000. Um, and so those systems have been created to tackle that challenge. Unfortunately, the side effect is that they narrow kids to a really, really narrow set of data, GPA, test scores. And our philosophy is that, unfortunately, that's reductive to a fault. That if you're going to have kids go through a much more multidimensional learning experience where you focus on interdisciplinary content and learning, you need school records, transcripts that cover more than just English, math, science, social studies, and foreign language. In a world where much more uh, education is personalized, where we're giving kids by design much more agency and control over what they learn and how they learn it, uh, where we encourage kids to try to take risks to fail, where we're literally teaching them things like entrepreneurship and design thinking, which have failure and iteration at the core of those things, it really doesn't make sense to give them credit based on Carnegie units, like actual credit hours or seat time. Um, and if you believe in equity, and believe me, our school leaders do, then you believe it really should be the purpose of schools not to sort kids on a curve to pick winners and losers, but really it should be to design schooling systems that serve all kids, uh, that expect them to perform, to maintain at least proficiency, if not mastery of these essential skills, even if some kids take more time to do it. Um, and so we're moving away from a factory model of education to a model, um, I think that's much more, you know, kind of future focused. And to do that, we need different kinds of school records, because if you lead one of these schools, no Carnegie units, no GPA, or, uh, and, you're, and a whole different set of skills versus your traditional academic core, you literally need a new transcript. And that's where the MT comes in, the mastery transcript. That's an actual tool that we've built. And we've built it with our schools, and we've built it with a lot of consultation from our friends in higher ed. 
Um, our goal, and we're a nonprofit, our goal is not to maximize profit, it's to drive change in the sector. And what we're trying to do is try and find a way to create not just a conversation or a dialogue, but literally like some middleware between the work that our schools are doing, kind of their, their outputs are these amazing kids with a whole different set of skills and abilities, and then try and give them something that reasonably matches the inputs for folks on the college admissions side. And we can talk a little bit more about how that's going and what that looks like, but that at a high level is what MTC is and is what we do. So what, what given, you know, you've, you've been looking at the higher ed space, I know you have, and, and also the uh, secondary school space for, and working within that for a long time. Um, you know, what kinds of things are, are really enablers or helpers right now um, that, you know, for, either the majority of the population or for many of the population, helping them to move uh, from adolescence to adulthood? So the, um, so enablers in terms of kind of like what's working, what's going well. I yeah, think what's working, what's working right now? What, what do you see, what do you see happening that's working? Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things we have going for us is that right now there are more kids that are prepared for college and college bound than at any time sort of in recent history. And there's a lot of reasons why that is. Um, one of them is just sort of the kind of like availability and ubiquity of really high quality instruction, kind of online, different resources, different models. Like I said, there's a ton of innovation that is happening in the high school K-12 space. Um, you know, I think there's sort of, uh, if, if you're involved in ed reform, there's this sort of almost kind of cliche of like kind of like tech billionaires thinking that they need to come in and like disrupt education, right? That, that's, that nothing, nothing interesting is happening. So they need to throw money at it and shake things up. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. There's enormous innovation that's happening locally at the grassroots level. Um, and really what is needed is to ways to connect these kind of different programs and kind of innovative leaders with one another and to give them support and kind of acceleration. So on the one hand, we're, we're definitely preparing more kids for college. The flip side of that, and, and I'm a big believer in sort of these kind of, you know, call them kind of healthy tensions or binaries, is that you know, anything you take to excess kind of a strength uh, to excess becomes a weakness. Mm -hmm. We've inadvertently told too many kids in high school now the only path to success is through a four-year college degree, mm -hmm. no matter what the cost, uh, no matter what the time, uh, no matter what the price, human price of it. And so you've got too many kids, um, whether it's kids in the neighborhood where I live who believe, you know, incorrectly, by the way, but they believe, and unfortunately their parents believe that if they don't get into the right college, that their life is over, like that their dreams are shattered before they've even left their house. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the pressures and anxieties and stresses that creates, that is having real world effect on college campuses today, right? So if you talk to, and I know you do, you talk to the folks that are making the budgets for the colleges and universities across country, they're having to allocate more money than ever for mental health resources and supports. So we got a lot of kids who are ready for college, but we're also giving them the wrong message to too many kids that college you know, is the only path to success. And we, in turn, we've got kids who are, because of that, thinking that they and their parents thinking that they need to pay any price whatsoever for college. And so they're taking in stunning levels of debt. Um, and I think one of the real challenges for us as a, call it as a sector or as a country is you've got too many kids who are graduating with massive amounts of debt. And in turn, the job that they're getting after they graduate is not appreciably better or more highly compensated than the one they might have gotten had they just gone straight to work. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then you've got too many kids who aren't even finishing the degree. So you're graduating the worst possible outcome, the trifecta of maladies, right? Some college, no degree, big debt, job you get is not improved. Uh, and so those are kids, adults really, who are now like by any measure worse off for that experience, right? So that's really something that we worry about quite a lot. So even as we're focused on helping the kids that go to MTC schools get access to the kinds of college campuses that they aspire to, we're really leaning very heavily into the fact that there's a lot of different flexible pathways and post-secondary options. And in a skills-based world, fortunately, um, you can be prepared for any of those. So, yeah, so it's, it's, both a, it's both a good and a bad. At MyMax, we're now working with some schools on stop out dropouts and how to help people with some college, some, uh, with some college and no degree come back 
to their institutions. And it's such a it's such a win 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 uh, for so many populations um, and and for the school itself. And it's um, you know I, I remember I was teaching adult literacy in the 80s uh, using interactive video discs. Uh, and uh, one of the benefits of using the discs um, was people could uh, learn to read as an adult uh, without the shame of yeah. a human watching them have trouble reading because everyone's supposed to be able to read. And I think of something similar related to that, some college no degree, um, that it's a very hard, one of the things we found in our uh, outreach to people to bring them back is, is that that personal, emotional and mental barrier. Um, yeah. I've also been writing a lot about the mental health crisis coming to higher ed pre-COVID. Um, I think post-pandemic, we are, we are looking at a lot of stress. So, uh, you know, what, what kinds of things, you know, on that note, on that mental health and on that, um, you know, sort of personal esteem standpoint, you know, what are some things that you think would be helpful uh, to, to comfort, you know, I, I, I like the, I think of, uh, you know, good educational principles is to disturb the comfortable and, com and, and comfort the disturbed. Um, that, you know, a good educator disturbs people who are comfortable in their own beliefs and maybe not well-founded, and then comforts those who are in a disturbed place to help them feel comfortable and, and knowledgeable and safe in their environment. So what are some of your thoughts about, you know, what can be done or what is being done um, around helping that individual? So I think, you know, the, the, the world that I know best, and it's not me personally or professionally, it's just because I have the privilege of working with, you know, these hundreds, if not thousands of amazing school leaders like that are in our network directly, or that we're working kind of in, in adjacent areas in, in the K-12 kind of transformation sector, uh, is that I think there are ways that we can have this is really bad for me. We can have our cognitive cake and eat it too on emotional well-being. Uh, um, and, and what I mean by that is um, there's a lot of times where, you know, um, the, I think the worm has already turned on like using the idea of grit, you know, as, as something to be kind of like kind of valorized in school. Like this idea of like, hey, your job as a kid is to just kind of buck up and soldier on and be tough and gut, gut things out. That sort of, for me, that kind of buys a little too much into the sort of like, hey, school's supposed to hurt. And so, but you, your job is to get through it so good things happen at the other end. And, and I just, if I, if I have like one thing, I just, we just categorically reject that idea uh, that instead I would like replace that idea of grit and, and replace it with resilience. Because resilience is something that can be taught. Um, it's not a, a character element where you're toughing things out. It's that in controlled environments, right? You can encourage kids to take risks, healthy risks. Um, you can encourage failure and show kids like it is okay not to get things right on the first try. That is a practice. It's a literally a discipline, right? And you can teach it and you can model it. You have to really walk the walk though. And so we talk a lot about the need to kind of rethink how we assess students. I'll just be very direct. Traditional grading is completely misaligned with that kind of skill development that I'm talking about. I can tell you as loudly as I want and as many different phrasings as I want that you should take risks. You should pursue your curiosities. It's okay to fail. But if my grading models give you a number percentile grade on everything you do, every homework assignment you hand in, every quiz you take from the moment you show up in school all the way through and just roll it up into an average, I'm giving you the exact opposite message. And kids are incredibly smart. They're very rational. They understand like what the rules of the system are, the rules of the game. So you have to really deprogram kids from traditional grading before you can get them to buy into this idea. But for the schools that are doing it really well, giving them space to try new things, giving kids space where you're giving them tons of feedback but you're not necessarily grading numerically every single thing that they're doing, the light bulb eventually goes on and they will actually start to try new things, understand how they can learn from their failures as opposed to just thinking of them as like penalties that they have to make up later for extra credit. Uh, and what you're gonna basically do if you have a whole community of educators and you know, learners working together in this environment, is you're just gonna graduate these awesome young adults who really understand and are resilient in a very healthy way. If high school wasn't something that they gutted out so that there was a prize at the end, 
It's something that they were actually allowed to grow. And so when they wind up in college campuses, even super traditional ones, like even high pressure campuses where, or you know, uh, colleges where everything's still being done in 500 person lectures and they're grading on a curve, those kids are still way better off because they have kind of built these metacognitive muscles about understanding how they learn, where they have difficulty, how to advocate for themselves, how to adjust on the fly. Whereas in the counter example is if you just treat, you know, high school as a series of worksheets, you know, a series of kind of numbered quizzes to, to uh, hoops to jump through, um, then when you get to college, it's just more of the same, right? So the biggest difference is you, you know, I think there's one question you would ask kids and sort of like, when you ask kids what they want to do in college, right? What do you want them to be able to say? Not, not what do you want to coach them to say? <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a whole uh, industry coaching kids to say the right things in interviews. But like, what do you really want them to mean, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you would think it's like, oh, we, they want to take advantage of, of these amazing learning environments, mm -hmm. grow and you know, kind of connect with people, connect with professors, you know, major in something that is that right sort of mesh between the things that are their areas of passion, but also being useful to the world. Um, and um, unfortunately, you know, too many kids are saying, well, why, do you, why are you going to college? Because it's what's next, because it's what I'm supposed to do. Well, what do you expect to do in college? I just, I'll do what I'm told. My job is to get good grades, right? And so, um, you know, that that's, I think, sort of for us where, the mental health and the intellectual health, they're actually, you know, I don't mean to sound kind of like too foo-foo about it, but like they really are you know, deeply linked and they have to do with sort of our teaching and, and, uh, and learning practices. I absolutely love a whole lot of stuff that you were touching on there. It's one of my favorite areas about the, the learning to fail uh, and creating a safe space, safe in all ways to fail, you know, physically safe. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, I got involved in in, in uh, C, you know CD-ROM based and and online learning is because it made sense to me that you could work with dangerous materials online uh, because you weren't physically gonna you could you know I, when I learned to become a pilot uh, and get my pilot's license I crashed a lot of planes but didn't actually crash anything um, yeah. you know and that was a great That's simulation right. uh, that was safe. Um, you know, right. versus being scared to death actually in the air um, of trying to not crash. Um, but I, I think I think where you're heading, I think is is super important. Uh, when a third grader asks the question, "Is this going to be on the test?" We know that we have squeezed all the wonder out of that experience and all the potential passion around discovery of something new. Uh, and we've moved into a, what I call a compliance-based uh, model where they're, yeah. they're in a lockstep compliance. I'll do what I need to do to get where I need to get to or where I think I need to get to. So we are a data and measurement obsessed culture. You and I both came from the corporate learning world. We got, we had to go through Kirkpatrick stuff, you know, for like how many years? I'm sorry to bring that up. Um, so, <laughs> but measurement, measurement, measurement. Anything worthwhile is worth measuring was sort of yep. an adage that we heard over and over again. And right. I think that same rubric or that same approach is being you know, used in schools. And, and I love what you're saying. I, I, I want our own children to fail with, again, in a safe space with minimal consequence, to fail forward to learn. Um, yeah. I think this is one of our biggest challenges in right. the whole system. So I'd love to hear your thoughts around the importance of measurement, right. how data is used, and how you create safe spaces yeah. for, for, for the teachers as well, because this is also burdening the teachers beyond beyond. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, so, so the, the teachers are, you know, they are, you know, it's an overused word, but the, the teachers are heroes in this model because they're being given impossible tasks, right? To ready kids for an endless barrage of standardized tests and sort of high stakes assessments, while they're also being, you know, told to kind of like, you know, and meet state standards, and then also sort of keep this intellectual fire, you know, burning in their kids. And, it, you know, it's, so, so you, we're only as good as the systems that we put our educators into, right? Um, we could go off on a really long sidebar, one of the things that, you know, and one of the things that's dangerous about talking to me is that I, 
I talk to a lot of schools about a lot of different things. And so as opposed to a PhD who goes really, really deep and can sort of go into the research, I'm sort of like, I connect the dots between lots of different things I'm hearing. So there's a whole separate thing about, um, it's crazy that teachers today from elementary through high school are still responsible for individually generating enormous amounts of their curriculum in their classrooms. Um, that's like so much, there's only so much time in a day you already got kids, you know, too many kids. And we're putting the cognitive load on, what are you gonna do on Wednesday? Like, figure it out, it's up to you. Like, yeah, you've got a textbook, but that's nearly not enough. So there's a whole separate kind of thing around that. Um, but I wanna go back to this idea of assessment because I think you're, you're, you're onto something. I think one of the challenges is that, and look, um, we're both in Massachusetts. I will say, and this may be an unpopular position, that I think one of the reasons that Massachusetts is generally regarded and you know, acknowledged in other data is having generally good schools, right? If you look at sort of how kids in Massachusetts perform on sort of these kind of international tests, if Massachusetts were a country, we would be up there with Singapore and Finland and everything else. Um, and I think it's because we do have sort of statewide accountability through the MCAS system, you know, that state tests. MCASs are enormously unpopular <laughs> in many parts of Massachusetts. They're pain, they're stressful for kids, you know. Um, but there is value in asking similar questions, checking the answers. And I've been in the room, I was on the um, school committee for my kids' middle school many years ago. They're out of middle school <laughs> a long time ago. But I was really impressed by the way our principals were very thoughtful about that data, right? They were really thinking about, hey, we're doing pretty well, you know. Nice town, you know, kids are doing good, but not all the kids, right? We've got too many kind of English as a second language learners that really have real gaps. We've got too many kids who are, the kids who are on free and reduced lunch in our community. There may not be a ton of them, but they're, they've got real gaps. So there was real thought and care about how you use that data. So I'm not opposed at all to standardized tests or measurements. The challenge with a lot of our standardized testing models for when they're sort of the high school to college base um, is that it's like it's that old saw about you know kind of the the drunk looking for his keys you know under the lamppost because not that's not where the keys are there but that's where the light is and so we have in the name of being able to test its scale we've created assessment models that are measuring the wrong things and they're having really negative consequences like backwards designed up into the curriculum and so a really good example of this would be, um, you know, if you look at sort of high stakes exams, I don't mean to pick on the AP because some of the AP is, they're doing interesting work with capstones and other things. But if you look at like AP history, right? If you're going to define success in history as writing a series of short essays under one draft, under a clock, and also regurgitating a lot of multiple choice questions, about what you've memorized or the ability to read passages, understand them, you're measuring something, but it's not what historians do. Uh, I'm, I would argue, I'm, I don't think it's even particularly good preparation for doing history like at a bachelor's degree level. Um, so we've taken the idea of standardizing something so that we can have a unit that's comparable. There's value in that, absolutely. But we've created an environment in where what the kids are doing in their history classes to get ready for that test, because that's now the goal, looks nothing like actual history. That's really weird. Um, and I think that's uh, a, a problem. Now, what's the alternative? Well, the good news is that, and there's some research that just got published, is that you can teach kids in team-based, project and problem-based ways about history, having them really explore, giving them long form projects that are complicated, really forces their critical thinking, looking at original sources, and they wind up doing really well in the AP anyway. Um, and so it is possible to break free of teaching to the test mm -hmm. and still have kids kind of check the box at the end of those. And so you can have your cake and eat it too there. What our schools are trying to do is just think of different assessment models that are rigorous, that are, you know, leveled or standardized. It's not just every teacher sort of using their own kind of yardstick or kind of putting a finger in the air. Um, Competency-based education personalized competency-based, learner-centered environments, they all got their roots in sort of standards-based grading, right? Every school that we work with has some kind of explicit set of levels or rubrics. Some of them will be on those to things like single point rubrics, and there's a lot of different models out there. But there's really value in writing down really clearly for everybody at the end of time period X or you know by a certain point in their career, 
learners should be able to do X, where X is really clear. And, and if they're not there, the real question is, what do you do if they're not there, right? The big difference in our schools is that instead of saying, well, they move on and maybe they'll get it later. Maybe we can give them some remediation on the side is that in a mastery based environment, you don't move on until you've really nailed it, right? And I think if, um, you know, not every solution is technology based, but I think if the um, Sal Khan and the Khan Academy had one big sort of tremendous contribution to the field, it was just sort of helping the light bulb go on for millions of people, including millions of parents, that the way that having kids progress in math without having truly mastered foundational concepts until they move on to something else is complete insanity, right? Right. right. But they to really carry, do that. Carry that, that deficiency forward, right? Yeah. Right, right. And, and a lot of his tools were very simple, right? Kids can rewind. And so they can look at things again. You can take as many sort of generated practice tests as you need to make sure you've nailed the concept, truly mastered it before you progress. And again, there's some advantages to being able to do that in math. And it's admittedly harder to do that if you're teaching kids how to write. But um, yeah, so um, what our schools are really thinking about is using feedback as opposed to um, using high stakes, multiple choice tests and giving kids complex problems. Um, having kids do complex tasks, whether they're individual independent studies or capstone projects or whether they're team-based projects, um, they force a kind of synthesis, uh, a way of using skills across different domain areas where the, you know, this, I, this goal of having kids learn in an interdisciplinary way is very organic and natural and well, well suited to the problem at hand. It's not something that you're forcing, right? So um, I think that's, a, that's where sort of the connections between your assessment models and your teaching models start to get very blurry in a good way. Well, as, as someone who started off teaching high school with four preps, uh, I loved your first comment around, can you believe that we're still asking teachers to create their own curricula? And, yeah. and so I was teaching in regions, you know, New York State regions uh, programs. And, and, uh, and when I started getting involved in, in CD-ROM based and online learning, light bulb went off for me because I also believe in, um, you know, sometimes the person that can help someone learn is someone like them. Uh, so I did a lot of peer-based kinds of things in the classroom, and it was clear to me that a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old uh, putting together something online, which they can do easily now with authoring yeah. tools, um, they could put it together a model to teach someone about something in biology that another 14-year-old could benefit from. I even went to the Massachusetts Education Department when MCAS were uh, rolling out and said, hey, guys, you should build an online curriculum for all state school, all the schools in the state for the basics around the core competencies that you wanna assess in the MCAS programs so that they can start with that online curriculum to yeah. build off of similar, this was before Khan Academy, but similar to you know something much more robust than Khan Academy in the sense of it would be aligned to the MCAS. And then the teachers in the classroom can focus on the needs of the learners, which that's the thing that they're good at. Yeah. Um, and and that's I, I completely agree. And I want to be very clear here, lest anybody think that I'm advocating that teachers be given a scripted, standardized curriculum. It, it, I believe the opposite is true. But I think they should have access to really high quality choices right. Right? Augment. that Augment. they can right. bring into and use and adapt right. on the fly. The, the, the key here is being able to use their judgment, right, which is the most important tool at their disposal. Um, but once you've made a judgment about what's needed, uh, I think forcing them, saddling them with a blank page and saying, great, no, go, go now create it. Or, you know, like, um, you know, the, this idea of like, you know, teachers paying teachers online to share mm -hmm. things. I love the impulse behind that. I love it. It's an elegant solution to a weird problem, but yeah. yeah. The YouTube, the YouTube sharing and so forth. I mean, but that could be, that could, that is what a state ed department could be doing is taking a lot of that lift out of the, out of the mix. So, That's right. um, Mike, you know, you, 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 I know you look forward, uh, you, you've always been someone who's thought forward, you know, what do you see, you know, going forward about, uh, you know, we talked about, you know, safety, mental health, intellectual health, um, some of these, you know, structures that currently exist, 
uh, and things are changing. So yeah. what do you see happening, you know, in the near or distant future around uh, things that are going to help adolescents move to adulthood and or things that are continue going to continue to be a challenge? What do you see as some of the top things? So, so I, I think there are three things, both near term and kind of longer term that I, I'm genuinely excited about and paying attention to. So one is the fact, if you look at sort of the University of California system getting rid of standardized testing, you know, getting rid of the SAT and ACT, and then many, many other um, colleges and universities following suit. I'm less, I mean, I think the moving away from that standardized testing model is a thing. I'm actually more interested in why they're doing it, right? And they're doing it because they are deeply committed to truly building equitable models that find talent across the country. And I hope anybody who's interested in this podcast would at least agree with the simple premise that the models we have today are overlooking staggering amounts of talent that's being lost, right? If, if, if you think the model we have today is working perfectly, but we'll just have to have a, an offline discussion about that. Uh, so I think that's one thing. Um, now, the real question is what models will replace it, right? And so that's where for us, very selfishly, both myself and on behalf of the schools we serve, we really think that there's more appetite now for competency-based education and, co and mastery-based models than ever before. And so, and we're really seeing this at the state level. Um, you cannot, so, so first of all, MTC got started because of individual innovative change agents that were out in different communities leading schools, schools of all types, public, charter, independent. We found a, a value and a need to connect them with one another. But no matter what, it's impossible for even the best single change agent in a state to really drive change at scale, unless you can get folks that make policy to come on board as well, right? At some point, somebody in the state legislature is going to have to say, you know what? We aren't actually going to legally require kids to study a certain number of credit hours of these subjects to prove college readiness. You need language to replace those old models. And that stuff is happening. The other thing that I find really encouraging that's directly connected to that is that even at a time where our nation is basically tearing itself apart at the seams, politically, um, schools are kind of ground zero for a lot of these discussions, whether it's banning books or certain kinds of buzzwords in the curriculum or you know, the role of school boards and parents and you, you, what have you. Um, the interesting thing is that mastery learning has a lot of proponents from both sides of the aisle, right? Uh, if you live in a blue state and you are really motivated by equity and by giving kids supports when they haven't traditionally been served well by the judicial system, and that's a driver of innovation for you, you know, you're likely to be really interested in mastery learning and what it means for you and your school. Uh, if you're just interested in brain science and innovation, if you want to trust the experts when it comes to teaching your kids and the experts are, you know, have studied kids' brains, you're going to really be in favor of school models that look very different from the school that you and I went to. But maybe you live in a red state. Maybe you're mostly focused on making sure your state is an employer of choice, that you can attract big industry. Um, whether it's the technology enabled manufacturing companies of tomorrow, uh, you want to be a pro business environment, you're going to need a 21st century workforce. You're going to need kids that can become adults, that can think for themselves, think critically, use advanced technologies. Where, um, you know, one of my, the big eye openers for me in my own professional development is I had a chance to do a site visit to the BMW plant in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and this is not Henry Ford's factory, right? It's not people kind of attaching a single screw. Uh, every, every vehicle moving through this incredibly high-tech facility is being built to spec. There's an RFID puck on the hood of every chassis that basically has the customer's order on it. And so from the moment that piece of steel starts down the line and starts moving through that facility, it's going to come out the other end to the exact specifications of somebody who placed an order in a dealership. And all the people around them are operating at an incredibly high level of technical skill um, and not just the management team, right? So if you need thousands of employees with those skill sets, you are really interested in mastery learning and rethinking high school. So it's an interesting place because, you know, we um, sometimes in innovation, you think it can get polarized, but actually we, we find that we've got lots of friends in all different places. And so uh, 
strange bedfellows perhaps, but uh, everyone's kind of pulling in the same direction. Yeah. And then lastly, I think be, uh, be, between that intersection between sort of how schooling can change, how college is changing, what workforce looks like, I just think the um, there are so many alternatives now to the four-year degree that are viable alternatives. Um, it used to be that we had two tracks, right? You had college managerial, and then you had vocational blue collar. Uh, and one, unfortunately, was stigmatized. Um, and that is just not true anymore. I think people are, for some of the reasons we touched on earlier about debt and about the degree and about mismatch between the skills a degree might signal versus skills you might need to pay off the debt for the said degree. Uh, I just think we're living in a really, really interesting time where kids who are absolutely ready for college and could get value from college have other paths that are perhaps equally, if not more attractive to them. Um, and as in some cases, these starts on the kind of the, the edge cases for technology, you know, coding boot camps and things like that. But it's also apprenticeship programs. Um, it's also sort of the, the trades really rethinking how they're using technology and leaning into education so that they can be seen as kind of a destination of choice. There's just a lot of interesting work happening. It's a, it's a good time, I think, to be working in the digital credential space or to be thinking about education from a skills framework as opposed to just a content framework. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciated catching up with you. Uh, great thoughts. Uh, I appreciate your sort of lateral thinking, you know, surveying view of, of uh, a broad landscape. And uh, I wish you the very best. And thank you for joining us for another Mind Maxing podcast series. So thank you, Lee. Have a good thanks, one. Mike. Yep. Thank you.